Hello, and welcome to another virtual tour from Turnstile Tours. My name is Stephen D.W., and I'm a, one moment, please let me make sure I got my slides down here. There we go. Uh, my name is Stephen D.W., and we're celebrating Climate Week here at Turnstile Tours with uh, today with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, the NYC EDC. And my colleague Andrew is out there on the waterfront in Lower Manhattan. Of course, climate change affects uh, many neighborhoods across all five boroughs and affects different parts of the country in different ways. Uh, but today we are going to focus on Lower Manhattan and the work that NYC EDC is doing to help mitigate the effects of climate change on that neighborhood. Uh, before we begin, uh, for those of you new to our programs, uh, we really love having these be interactive, and I'm here to help make that happen. Uh, so if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat box. That's how you're going to ask your questions of our presenters today and, uh, and interact with one another. You can select uh, all uh, panelists to ask a question directly to me and I'll pass it on to Andrew and our guests, or you can select all panelists and attendees and chat amongst yourselves as well. Introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. Uh, we also are streaming on Facebook and uh, we're uh, doing a closed captioning through Facebook today. So uh, look for that out there. Uh, but uh, we'll, before we go to Andrew and the waterfront, let's take a quick look at some of our upcoming uh, events, our live programs uh, here at Turnstile Tours. So later today, we will be back at uh, three o'clock with uh, another in our series of programs on Thai cuisine. That's at three o'clock today. Uh, Tuesday, we will be going into our manufacturing with uh, Bien Hetero, the uh, company that uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that works with uh, sustainable sourced lumber and uh, does woodworking and also teaches woodworking classes. Thursday, we're back to the topic of climate change with our friends in Prospect Park. And uh, we're looking at, forward to Friday, National Manufacturing Day. Lots of great programs this week. Of course, None of this would be possible without your help, and uh, you help us by becoming a member of Turnstile Tours. You know, this company has been around for quite a while. We've been uh, partnering with nonprofits to help them share their stories, and with the pandemic, we pivoted to doing these, uh, these uh, virtual programs, and this is how you can interact with us and sustain these programs, help us to continue sharing the stories for these nonprofits by becoming a member at a quartermaster or steward or apprentice level uh, for as little as five dollars a month uh, and uh, of course these make great gifts as well so uh, without further ado then i uh, will look forward to talking to you in the chat but now let's go to the waterfront and uh, where andrew and our guests from nyc edc are uh, waiting to speak to us all andrew are you there all right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Jefferson, um, and we're here in Lower Manhattan. Um, you know, this is not only a series that we're doing um, for our Climate Week, but it's also a series um, that we're doing with our great partners at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and so I want to introduce uh, today's guest uh, today. So first I have with me uh, Elijah Hutchinson. So uh, can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role? Sure, thanks Andrew. Um, my name is Elijah Hutchinson. You might be muted. Forgive us while we figure out these technical difficulties. Okay, how's that? Much better. <laughs> Hi, my, my name is Elijah Hutchinson. I'm a vice president of Waterfront at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I work largely on our coastal infrastructure and resilience projects at EDC. I've been with them for over eight years now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience today and our infrastructure um, and uh, initiatives in, in Lower Manhattan. We also have Jocelyn Dupre. Hello, I'm Jocelyn Dupre, Assistant Vice President with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, working on climate change, resiliency, and neighborhood planning. Look forward to being here today and talking to you about the Financial District Seaport Master Plan 
climate risk and how you can be a part of the solution. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to Turnstiles Tours also for giving us the opportunity to spread the word about our Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience Initiative and just talk about resilience and climate change in general. We're always looking for new and different ways to reach new audiences, um, making sure we're getting the word out there about our projects and our um, and, and just educating people about climate risk is central to, to the work that we're doing. So we're super happy to be here and, and thank you to Turnstile Tours and um, thank you for everybody for being flexible with the format as we socially distance um, and stay safe during COVID. Uh, we're here because um, we're gonna learn about uh, resilience. Okay, sorry, <laughs> my mask is falling. Um, we're here because uh, New York City is facing an existential threat. Um, Lower Manhattan itself is, is at the core of that threat and is um, central to uh, New York City as a whole. So what happens to Lower Manhattan is something that we should all care about as New Yorkers. Um, because of the diversity of what Lower Manhattan is to New York, and to the people who live and work and reside here. Um, recognizing this importance in March of last year, the mayor, along with Gail Brewer, our borough president, um, the mayor's office of resilience and the president of EDC, James Patchett, um, announced um, the first kind of comprehensive climate resilience study of its kind uh, for Lower Manhattan that took into account a range of risks and hazards um, and looked at what is the future of Lower Manhattan going out into the not just today in the 2020s, but the 2050s, the 2080s, and the 2100s, um, and how do we account for climate change within our planning and think about what are actions we can do today um, to help mitigate some of those risks. Um, what that announcement included was the release of a Lower Manhattan Climate Resilience Study. I'm going to hold it up here. It's available on our website for download um, on EDC's website. Um, this in and of itself tells you the whole story of what we analyzed, what we found, um, and what's kind of driving uh, this initiative. There's a lot of climate science in here. Um, we're gonna get to that a little bit later on in a tour with Jocelyn as we talk about risks um, and what we can anticipate to see from sea level rise. Um, but we're also gonna talk in depth about all of the projects that make up a comprehensive resilience strategy for Lower Manhattan. Um, the announcement included uh, over $500 million of capital projects to help mitigate the impacts of climate change that are waterfront reconstruction projects um, running around the Battery, uh, Battery Park City, um, the Two Bridges neighborhood to our north, um, and we're going to see a couple of other um, projects along the way here as we walk through the financial districts and seaport neighborhoods. What the announcement also included was a new planning phase specifically for the specifically for the seaport and the financial district where we had trouble locating a capital project because of the various constraints and the nature of the floodplain here. It makes it very difficult to do a, a capital project um, under these existing conditions. And so we really needed to spend a lot more time and resources to figure that out with the community. Um, and uh, Jocelyn is gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so. Lower Manhattan, uh, in and of itself, we're standing here at um, Manhattan Park. Um, we wanted to pick here as the beginning of this tour because in a lot of ways, this is the beginning of New York City um, as we understand it today. Um, the people here, uh, the indigenous population were the Lenape Indians. Um, they inhabited uh, Manhattan as it was called back then. And um, that, um, as, as the, the um, from, from the 1600s onto the 1700s, what you had is um, Dutch colonial settlement, um, the introduction of the slave trade uh, in Lower Manhattan, um, and an evolving waterfront over time. Um, Lower Manhattan has been constantly evolving um, through the maritime and waterfront industry, the introduction of industrialization, um, and the center of finance, both for New York City and, and, and for the United States at the time, or what was, you know, the colonial um, America. Um, we're actually also at the location of New York's first municipal, or New York's municipal slave market. Um, in 1711, this was actually the site um, where slaves were sold. Uh, New York City um, 
had 42% of its households owning slaves um, in the 1700s. And um, there's a plaque over there commemorating it. I won't go into it, but if you're ever down in lower Manhattan, I suggest you come by and, and, and check out some of this history. Um, the, the first non, yes, the first non-indigenous inhabitant of lower Manhattan was actually a, a black man from Hispaniola by the name of Juan Rodriguez. Um, so the history of New York really starts out with um, a black man working for the Dutch uh, East Indies Trading Company, um, living here to trade with the natives um, and really forming the foundation of this as a trading post and, and maritime um, uh, industry area. The um, Dutch came in, introduced slavery, um, and so you end up seeing a, a proliferation of that um, through the 1700s until that slave trade uh, closes in the 1760s, I believe. Um, since the 1760s on, uh, you could see a lot of historic architecture in the seaport, which is a lot of manufacturing, really um, old manufacturing buildings is what they are. Uh, they stored grain, they stored raw, raw materials, um, and all of that um, was fed out into our New York Harbor, which is the big strength of New York City. Um, we are at a, heart, a port city. We are a city of islands. There is hundreds of miles of coastline within Lower Manhattan. Um, but what you have here in, in Lower Manhattan is the second largest business district in the country, um, an area where many New Yorkers um, work. Um, someone from every community board um, across the city works in Lower Manhattan. Um, and over, for, um, over half of the jobs, over the half of the people that work in Lower Manhattan um, actually don't reside in Lower Manhattan. They, four out of five of those people do not live in Lower Manhattan. So it's a real regional job center. Um, and it's a place where a lot of people travel through um, New York City, Lower Manhattan has over um, half a million commuters a day that pass through this area. Um, and so you could see how important it is for people to be able to continue to use Lower Manhattan, um, both as a destination, but also as an important place to pass through and a place that has a lot of critical infrastructure, including 75% of our subway lines, um, uh, all of our, um, our ports for our maritime industry, including Pier 11 and Wall Street and the Brookfield Terminal and the Staten Island Ferry, the Brooklyn Battery Ferry, um, and other important maritime waterfront uses, um, including a heliport and, um, and, and other retail and recreational and open space uses that are vital to the community. Um, the New York City itself, due to climate change, has uh, the largest wage exposure of anywhere in the country. We have the most jobs in the floodplain and we also have a very aggressive um, $20 billion initiative to, um, to, to um, mitigate the risks of climate change across the city. Um, so while I'm talking about projects in Lower Manhattan, there's a broader portfolio of projects happening out in Queens, happening in Red Hook, um, planning studies that have been done in, in Coney Island, um, also resilient studies in Hunts Point, that we won't quite get to, but if you ever need more information, feel free to come to EDC's website or the Mayor's Office of Resilience website for more information on those projects. Um, so I was thinking we walk and talk about Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience and all the projects that make up that initiative. Yeah, exactly. That, that sounds great. And I just wanted to point out one other thing, Elijah, which is uh, the street that we're standing on. Um, so we're at yes. the corner of Wall Street and Water, and Water Street. Street. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. And maybe um, we can pull up some of those slides um, that show some of the historic uh, coastline um, as, we're, uh, as we're walking. Sure. Um, if the camera could just kind of look up and down. Um, we're, on, we're on Water Street. Um, and Water Street is called Water Street because this is where the coastline used to be. If you're over by um, Titanic Park where there's a memorial for the Titanic because this is where the Titanic was supposed to dock, um, and it never made it. But there's a memorial and uh, there's a, a, a line on the ground where you could see the historic shorelines of, of New York City. Um, and really the story of this area is one that has been filled in over time for generations. Um, if you wanna think about infill uh, or, or filling in water, th this has been going on for hundreds of years in Lower Manhattan. Um, and I can no longer hear myself.
Can you, can you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, for generations, the shoreline has been being filled in. And what you're seeing, um, oh, are they seeing the graphics for the shoreline fill in? Sorry, we're we gonna switch graphics. Slide? Yes. Great. Yeah, so um, going back to its time as Manahata, um, the waterfront six to 1600s has been progressively filled in over time. What that has meant is that the waterfront eventually just gets more low-lying and low-lying and low-lying as you get towards the waterfront, which increases the, the climate risks that the area has. Um, and all of the areas built on historic fill, um, often uh, landfill, trash, um, debris, other materials that were used for generations over generations um, to keep on going out into the shoreline. So here we are on Water Street, kind of the historic shoreline of New York City. If we were looking out here, we would have just seen merchant marine ships and a shoreline, maybe oyster fishing and other things like that. Um, and what's interesting about Lower Manhattan and thinking about how it's grown over time is it's also expanded to the west with Battery Park City. Um, most recently, Battery Park City was filled in from the fill excavating the World Trade Center site. Um, and so that area on the west side you, um, has been uh, filled in and only recently developed. And as, a such, as such, because it was filled in more recently, is at a much higher elevation than the rest of Lower Manhattan. Um, and so as you go from the west side around the southern tip of Lower Manhattan to the east side, you gradually get into a lower area a floodplain that uh, spreads back further into the community um, and a much more robust waterfront of lots of different uses, lots of different existing infrastructure, subway tunnels that pass underneath the FDR drive that really um, complicate that waterfront. Um, so um, New York City has a history of um, expanding land and Justin's gonna talk more about that when we get over towards the waterfront. Um, for now, what I'm gonna talk about is the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience Projects. And um, you could go to that original slide of the map. Of, uh, the, the projects that make up the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resilience. Um, first, um, going around uh, from the west side uh, to the east side, <laughs> we have um, uh, projects that are happening at Battery Park City Authority. Um, by Battery Park City Authority for um, the Battery Park City neighborhood. Um, like I mentioned, because that neighborhood was built so recently, it's a, at a lot higher elevation. Um, and so um, those projects themselves um, are looking at um, berms and flood walls and other places to integrate um, op uh, resilient infrastructure into the open spaces in the battery. Um, as you come around to the um, uh, what used to be called Battery Park, which was now formally now renamed the Battery. Um, the park at the Battery itself is um, currently undergoing emergency repairs by EDC uh, because the piles um, are in such poor condition uh, that we're needing to go out there and stabilize it because there's so much waves, there's so many waves and there's so much abuse that that waterfront faces um, from a very active coastline um, that we're there doing repair work right now. Um, EDC is going to be designing and um, rebuilding that wharf so that it's a much more resilient structure that can withstand wave impacts um, and it'll be an elevated wharf so that um, uh, it protects against sea level rise going all the way out until 2100. Um, that, that project in and of itself will be great because it really preserves a lot of the historic nature and character of the battery um, while not blocking views out to the waterfront. And then we're also coordinating with Battery Park City Authority um, to build some sort of um, flood infrastructure, a berm or flood wall at the backside of the park to provide the neighborhood um, that coastal storm surge protection, the kind of impacts that we saw during Sandy, for instance. Um, as we come around, we'll, we'll talk about the financial district in Seaport, but really these buildings here were, were devastated by Sandy. We had two lives lost um, in lower Manhattan, not far from here. Um, we had billions of dollars worth of damage. Um, and so a lot of these buildings here are, you know, still um, dealing with a lot of that aftermath, um, have done a lot of work to 
um, flood proof their buildings, um, including elevating their mechanicals, um, buying their own flood, and, uh, flood protective barriers that get deployed um, in the event of a storm, um, as well as needing to retrofit a lot of their electrical um, and, and harden um, the base of the buildings. Um, so a lot of private owners are, are acting on their own to do things, um, but this area continues to face a lot of climate risks. And in some ways it's ironic because, you know, we've been able to find projects for other areas, but really um, it's, it's so hard to find a project here because it's so complicated, but there's so much to lose here. And so it's, it's so much, it's, it's really, really important to make sure um, that we aren't letting water in um, when we have all of this critical infrastructure around um, that is so critical for us to make sure that we protect and maintain. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we're gonna come over, we're crossing now South Street. Um, we're going to the waterfront. Um, we are um, going to be talking um, to um, uh, Catherine. McVeigh Hughes is one of our community stakeholders. He's um, the president of the FIDI Neighborhood Association, executive <laughs> director, um, and, um, and and talking about flood risks as we can as we wait to cross the street. <laughs> okay, I think we're okay. So you want to talk climate risk or do interviews first? Hmm. I can talk about the fire. Yeah. So we're walking up here to the waterfront where we're already seeing water coming and splashing over on a day like today when the tides are high at over six feet. So you can see it right here. So we can just step down and talk a little bit more about what we're seeing today and what we're going to see in the future. Yeah. <laughs> well. As we can see, climate change is here. It's not some far off distant thing that we're going to see in the future. And here in lower Manhattan, there are great risks of both coastal storms like we saw during Hurricane Sandy, as well as regular daily tidal inundation. By 2050s, we expect the water to rise another 2.5 feet and over six feet by 2100. What that means for the waterfront here is that we'll experience daily tidal inundation coming up into lower Manhattan. How does this work? Imagine you're standing at the beach and at high tide, the water comes in farther up onto the shoreline and at low tide, it moves away. That same thing happens along all of New York City's shoreline every day. We have high tide and low tide two times a day. And in the future, that high tide is expected to come over a block inland. Flooding areas, not only streets, buildings and basements, but also our ferries and our subways causing citywide and regional impacts. We'll also see more severe coastal storms in the future, more intense, more frequent. Those are nor'easters, tropical storms, and hurricanes, again, like we saw during Hurricane Sandy, which Eliza talked about a bit, the devastating consequences to life, to property, but also to our transit system, to all the businesses and jobs that were shut down, both short and long term. In the future, the 100 year floodplain is anticipated to come in and impact over a third of all the properties in lower Manhattan, as well as all of that critical infrastructure that we talked about. We can't wait to take action. We have to do something now, but there's no one size fits all approach. Each neighborhood is different and the threats are different and it requires a unique and tailored approach. We also have short-term measures that the city is implementing, and I'll pass it back to Elijah to talk a little bit about the city's interim flood protection measures to protect lower Manhattan now. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, 
uh, are the interim flood protection measures um, is a project led by emergency management uh, for the city. Um, we, uh, when having a comprehensive strategy for Lower Manhattan, needed to make sure that we were doing um, something now for the um, immediate storm season. Um, so what you're seeing um, over underneath the FDR drive are actually uh, called, called HESCO barriers. Um, and they're filled with about a ton of sand and they are put there in place to block the water from um, coming into uh, lower Manhattan during some of those more frequent storm events that are of, of lower um, tidal elevation and tidal impact. Um, you can kind of see that it's covered with a mural right now. We can walk over um, to make that clear. Um, the um, the barriers are here. Um, they're a temporary measure, but can last here for about five years before they need to be replaced. Um, they um, are in a, a oh solid God, alignment. Yeah, and then in anticipation of a storm, uh, tiger dams are filled with water and connect one row of HESCO barriers to another row of HESCO barriers. And I can't find the other row <laughs> right now. <laughs> There's another one behind the playground. Um, so what that does is it forms a complete line of barriers um, uh, in, in lower Manhattan for, for these neighborhoods in anticipation of storm. We just had to activate the system for the most recent storm, uh, is Isaiah? Yeah. Um, and um, learned a lot of lessons about activating it and the operations plan and what it means for traffic and um, how to make sure that we have the crews ready to um, come in and, and deploy the system um, with, um, with, with very short notice. Um, and so all of that is operated out of the emergency command center led by emergency management over in Cabin Plaza um, and coordinated citywide. This is one of um, about 50 different sites across the city that have this interim flood protection installed. Um, another one that's in a neighborhood is along Beard Street and Red Hook, if you're in Brooklyn and you wanna go check that out. Um, and then there's other uh, barriers like this across other critical facilities, um, pump stations, um, nitro properties, um, all, all over the city. Um, so that's the interim protection uh, program that'll be in place for the next five years while we try and figure out what the other capital projects are that can provide that permanent protection for the neighborhood that's so sorely needed. And I'm actually going to introduce you to Catherine McVeigh Hughes, who um, is uh, someone who knows so much about climate change in Lower Manhattan and resilience. Um, maybe even before Sandy, you cared about this, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but that's, yeah. Um, but we'll start off with um, who are you and, and why does uh, Lower Manhattan and this neighborhood matter to you? Um, over three decades ago, I was married in 1988 and moved down here and um, raised a family. And some of, some people might say we were the early pioneers, but actually the transition of a 24-7 neighborhood was happening then. It was just a lot less dense than it is today. And um, it allowed my husband, who was working seven days a week all the time, to be able to uh, manage family life as well. Mm -hmm. um, at college, I, I actually have a civil engineering degree in the emphasis of hydrogeology, which is water and rocks. Mm. And um, my first job was for the individual who founded the International Construction Company, which you probably never heard of, but you did after 9-11 because he built the slurry wall at the Royal Trade Center site. Mm. So no one knew what a slurry wall was until 9-11. Not only after the terrorist attacks, it kept out the Hudson River, it was even able to keep out was the only thing standing was able to keep the water out after a prior terrorist attack. So um, we know there's technology, we know it can be done, and um, the situation we have here is keeping out the New York Harbor and the East River. And what are some of your concerns about climate change? Um, climate change change is a multifaceted problem that transcends multi areas of our economy and our quality of life. Immediately, um, we see the threat of sea level rise, a 
eroding and corroding our surrounding underground infrastructure. We have a lot of infrastructure here and um, storm surge. So during Superstorm Sandy, it happened at night when unfortunately a lot of these big extreme weather events are. I remember coming here um, up here, water and wall the next day, seeing my neighborhood completely transformed and devastated. It was not only the small buildings, both residential and commercial, it was the entire stretch along here um, in the five I area going up through the South Street Street Court. We saw the guts of building out on the streets. It was a very long road of recovery. And it was the second time that um, the New York Stock Exchange had to be closed. Um, so it is, you know, the power was out. It was a wall of water. It was a wall of sewage that came across. It was not clean water, it was sewage. It came through uh, the drainage pipes. It destroyed basements, it destroyed first floors. Windows were blown out, trees were toppled. We even had a loss of life in a couple blocks away the south of the New York Stock Exchange. And some people were never able to re recuperate. So it's, it's really important that we protect the lower Manhattan, the tip here, which was where New York City started. Um, and we have a lot of cultural and historic landmarks that we need to protect. And what does success look like for you for the, the planning process for the financial district and the seaport? One, it needs to be funded. Right now, a lot of people think it's funded, and it's not. Only the engagement, the community process has been funded. Two, it needs to be built. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part. Three, if the extreme weather events that we're experiencing in the Atlantic Gulf Coast, it needs to be able, we need to be able to keep the lights on and the water out. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a very critical component of it. Mm -hmm. And um, four, it, it's got to be livable. we got to be able to interact still with the waterfront that we are able to do today. And you mentioned engagement, which is critical to the success of, 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 of this plan and really I think any planning process. Um, we recently had a community open house uh, where we invited um, everyone, anyone um, to come through an immersive experience in Lower Manhattan and learn about different climate risks um, climate change and how it's impacting their neighborhood in Lower Manhattan um, and the city strategy to do something about it. Um, we have some VR <laughs> that we used um, that uh, uh, we got a lot of really positive feedback on. Um, if you're listening in at home, there's a YouTube link available um, where our VR is posted. If you have your own VR goggles, you can put on those goggles and um, and, and use and play the YouTube video and experience what we're experiencing. We're also going to be showing stills of the VR video um, on your screen so that you can see what we're seeing. Um, let me pull this up. It is a uh, um, a superimposed image of flood risks uh, that we're facing today in the 2050s and in the 2100s right at this location um so um give this to catherine um what catherine is able to do is look around in full 360 degree view and see how sea level rise is going to be impacting this exact area um, from the 2050s through the 2100s and so she's able to see um, as, um, as time goes on that there's really a new shoreline in lower Manhattan um, that, uh, that comes about from sea level rise in and of itself and water slowly starts to creep up. Um, and that's regular daily tidal inundation and flooding that will be occurring in the future um, should the most conservative projections um, uh, of, uh, of sea level rise um, um, happen. And um, what we also can show in the VR videos is not just what happens when sea levels rise, but also what happens as sea levels rise and we have major coastal storm events like Sandy um, and the impact of sea level rise um, and more intense storms on our waterfront. 
and it's when you combine those things together into the future that you really start to see um, how impactful some of these flooding events could really be. Um, Sandy in and of itself was a moment in time, um, uh, but as we go on, we're gonna get more intense storms, more intense storms more frequently that could be combined with more intense rain events. Um, and of course, aging infrastructure below ground, old pipes, sewers, um, outdated drainage system that really was designed and built to handle a different world. And so what we need to do now is design and build infrastructure for the future and really look at all this together comprehensively. And for that, um, I'll pass it over. Oh, yeah, sure. Superstorm Sandy, I just want to make clear. Lots and buckets did not work. Mm -hmm. It did not work. We need a sustainable, best available technological approach here using best sciences. Mm -hmm. just want to add that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we're going to talk about now the FIDI Seaport Master Plan in, in more detail with Jocelyn. Thanks. Oh. Okay, thank you. You don't have to stay around if you don't. I am now unmuted. For the financial district in South Street Seaport neighborhoods, we face unique constraints that make it particularly challenging to site the flood protection infrastructure we need here. Along the waterfront, you can see we have very little space, and space is exactly what's needed to site coastal flood protection. Here, we across most of the financial district and seaport, we have less than 50 feet of space. Whereas to the north in East River Park, where the city is moving forward with the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, you have seven times that with over 300 feet of space, where you can fit berms and levees and all of that critical infrastructure that's needed to protect our shoreline. Here you also have the elevated FDR Drive, a highway running along the waterfront, as well as maritime uses, bringing tremendous boat and ferry traffic, as you can see right here to the area. Beyond all of the infrastructure and all the constraints that you can see, there's all the invisible infrastructure underground, multiple subway tunnels, the battery underpass, bringing vehicular traffic through the area, as well as right here along South Street, a major utility corridor for all of Lower Manhattan. All of this infrastructure makes it incredibly challenging to site the coastal resilience infrastructure that we need. We also need to ensure that while we're stopping water from coming in, that we upgrade our drainage system to ensure that we have the capacity in our sewers to handle water so that it doesn't just come up from below, flooding our streets and our basements. Because of all these constraints, we've launched the Financial District Seaport Climate Resilience Master Plan to come up with a solution for this area. We'll be studying a range of options, including extending the shoreline out into the water and then narrowing down on what the most promising option is by the end of the plan. To achieve this really ambitious plan, we've brought on a team of experts led by Arcadis, a Dutch engineering firm, being global expertise and the best thinking from around the world to solve this unique challenge. We know that this plan is not gonna be done tomorrow. It's gonna to take decades to implement and we need to plan for the long-term future of this area. What we, we hope to do by the middle to end of next year is to ensure that we have a plan, a plan for the long-term future, as well as a first phase project that we can move forward into implementation past this administration and beyond. We know that to achieve that plan, we need a broad coalition of community support, which will take all of you to be a part of it. We also need to make sure that we have a feasible plan that is both technically sound and can be implemented. To do that, our team of experts is undertaking an array of different analyses to ensure that this project can move forward. That includes one of the largest studies of the East River ever done to understand the habitats and fish species that are there today and how any project might impact that critical ecology. We also know from a community perspective that looking at things from an environmental and ecologically sensitive perspective is critical. And we have members on our team of experts that specialize in this area. 
we'll also be looking at the East River and how it flows and the speeds to ensure that any project is carefully considering navigation of our boats, of our ferry system, and thinking about that critical underground infrastructure and any impacts it may have. We'll also be looking at all of this transportation and maritime infrastructure and drainage to ensure we're planning for the long-term future with climate change. We'll be doing all of this and so much more, but we can't do it without all of your help. So please get involved, follow the plan, and Elijah will talk a little bit more about our community engagement and how you can be a part of it. If Thank I can so break much, in Justin. for just a second here Sorry. before we go to Elijah. Sure. Uh, we, yeah, we had a question from the audience about how uh, companies bid on these projects. Oh, absolutely. So um, for every project, we release what's called a request for proposal um, that we put out publicly. Um, so we put out this request for proposals last year. Um, a number of different firms bid um, from around the world and locally as well. Um, and then there's a competitive process um, that is done for all um, public projects to ensure um, that there's a fair way that we're assessing all of those different responses and, ex and selecting a team with the best qualifications to carry the work forward. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, we're gonna um, walk a little bit and I'm gonna talk about some of our um, recent uh, projects in, in Two Bridges as well. Um, as, as Jocelyn mentioned, uh, climate change is here now. Um, we, as part of our engagement, um, changed all of the Link NYC stations in Lower Manhattan to say climate change is an emergency. Come to our website. Um, and it was a really great interactive tool so that anyone walking around Lower Manhattan can log on and see um, this is the height of water that we can anticipate. Um, this is what the city's doing about it and, and to really understand what those risks are. Um, as, um, as we've been saying, the, the climate change is here now. One example of that is sea levels have already risen since 1900 um, by over a foot. Should we walk a little? Yeah. Okay. Um, sea levels have already risen um, by uh, over a foot since 1900. Um, and recently, um, NOAA released a study that, that they were predicting that um, the battery tide gauge, which monitors the level of water in New York Harbor, um, will um, calculate three times, will, will observe um, three times as many more overtopping events of our bulkhead than what we experienced just in the year 2000 which shows you that even in the last 20 years, um, we're starting to see kind of um, our infrastructure really be facing um, the, the limits of their constraints. Um, and all of the, that stress um, puts, um, puts a lot of means that we need to continue to invest in that infrastructure um, to update it for the, the challenges um, that we're facing today. A key part of that is the Two Bridges Project um, another critical uh, project called the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project. Um, we call it BMCR. Um, that project located in the Two Bridges neighborhood is just on the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, that project, we received HUD funding, um, funding from the Housing and Urban Development from the federal government. Um, it's it's all, along the waterfront, it's here, <laughs> but just beyond the Brooklyn Bridge, in between the Brooklyn Bridge and, and the Manhattan Bridge, essentially. Um, that project um, is uh, very innovative in its approach um, in that it has a series of barriers that are buried in the ground, um, and in anticipation of a storm, the barriers will flip up, um, on average being about over 10 feet high, or over 13 feet high from the elevation that you're standing on. And so if you could imagine, you know, with the push of a button, when we know a storm's coming, a place that looks like a park in Esplanade, because we'll have programming on top of it, will suddenly become very clearly flood infrastructure. And those barriers raise out of the ground um, and stop those coastal storm surges. Ah! <laughs> and stop those coastal storm surges from, from, from coming into the neighborhood. One of the things that was very important for designing 
um, BMCR was making sure that it addressed sea level rise um, so that we're not constantly putting up these um, barriers for these low level events. Um, and so what we've done is the, the Esplanade itself is on average at a current elevation um, of about six, let's say a six and a half and a um, NAVD-88, which is a coordinate plane system that I won't get into. But um, essentially um, what we're doing is permanently as passive structures, structures elevating um, portions of the Esplanade um, so that those low level events um, uh, the, the, we don't have to use operating gates to, to mitigate those. Um, and by the 2050s, we're expecting um, overtopping of that area to happen 70 to 80 times per year. Um, so that's a very significant um, flood impact and flood risk um, to that neighborhood. And adjacent to that neighborhood is an entire residential population, um, uh, a, a mix of uses, um, of, you know, of a really busy community, lots of waterfront assets um, that that project is protecting. Um, and so we were awarded um, $176 million from the federal government to, to move forward with that project. Um, and so um, all of these capital projects um, we were anticipating would be in construction in 2021. Um, now with COVID, we'll see. But um, the uh, Two Bridges project is um, an example of a really innovative infrastructure project that also needs a lot of, um, you know, community support and buy-in um, so that we can work together with the community to understand what are those programming opportunities, what are the possible um, ways in which people can use that esplanade that would really um, make sure that we're not just building coastal infrastructure that's going to stop water, but we're building infrastructure that people can really use and benefit from for the 99% of the time in which we're not flipping up the gates. And so it's really important um, that we have uh, infrastructure that is very multi-purpose and that serves a multitude of uses and a multitude um, type of users um, in order for there to, to really be success for those projects. Um, the New Yorkers use their waterfront a lot. Um, uh, I, I, I imagine a lot of people um, listening in this um, are New Yorkers. Um, Two Bridges is no different, and uh, that area of the Esplanade remains um, largely unimproved in a lot of ways. Um, so it's not the same kind of conditions that we have here. You don't have an FDR drive that's dropping into the ground in a tunnel. You don't have all the active maritime uses there. Um, you have different subsurface infrastructure constraints. You have a different floodplain even where two bridges rapidly rises up um, and um, increases in elevation, the financial district in Seaport actually dipped low um, and are, are a little bit like a bowl. Um, and the floodplain goes back for a long period of time. So it makes citing a project like that um, in the financial district in Seaport um, pretty impossible and challenging to do. And so that's why, as Jocelyn mentioned, um, in this neighborhood, um, we're looking at um, areas in which we can extend the shoreline to accommodate that infrastructure because what we see is that there's no one size fits all for these projects. There's never one project in one neighborhood that looks the same as a project in another neighborhood because each project needs to respond to the unique constraints of that, um, of, of, the, of the infrastructure and the things that are there in that neighborhood and the unique climate risks that that neighborhood is facing and the opportunity to do something about it. And so it's a nexus of really those three things, um, which, um, you know, in working with the community, we end up coming up with these projects that look actually quite different from one another, but in a lot of ways achieve the same thing and protect against the, uh, the same risks um, that we're gonna be facing in the 2050s um, well, with the 100 year storm surge, as well as sea level rise um, going forward for, for generations. Um, we're actually coming up against another system of HESCO barriers. Um, remember, I was saying they kind of all connect with each other. Um, this is another group of, of barriers that are always going to be there. Um, and then you could see, if you turn around, you could see how it connects to the other system of barriers underneath the FDR drive. And so big tiger dams, tubes full of water, um, connect these barriers together in the event of a storm. Um, Gail Brewer, our, our borough president, um, 
also um, did a, a international um, design competition for the barriers themselves um, and worked with um, local artists, um, youth, um, who actually put together um, uh, art and, and decorated the barriers themselves to pretty them up a little bit so that they have um, less of, of, a, of a visual impact on, on the community itself. Um, and so um, with all of these things, um, we are continuing to, to really think through strategic, innovative, and um, engaging ways to try and, and, and connect to people. Um, one of the examples um, where's, where's the high watermark sign? <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, there it goes. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you over to something that actually uh, Catherine had worked on um, with a lot of other community stakeholders after Sandy with the city um, to identify what are high watermark lines um, that happened during Sandy. Um, I think in lower Manhattan, in, in two bridges, um, at the Battery, um, in the financial district, we have a lot of really invested community stakeholders. Um, and so we're trying to um, tap into that local expertise as much as possible um, to help provide consistent feedback to us um, and, and, and the city when we're thinking through infrastructure solutions for the neighborhood. Um, we want to make sure we have a very transparent community process, one that's credible um, and that people um, really understand um, why, um, why one thing is happening and another thing isn't. And that's been really, really um, important for us coming up with a shared kind of vision with the community on what a, on what a possible project is. Um, and so <laughs> to that extent, um, we've worked really hard to try and bring community members together um, with um, what we call the Climate Coalition for Lower Manhattan. Um, and we also regularly engage um, with the community board here in CB1 and CB3 um, to uh, provide regular updates as well as regularly updating all of the elected officials on, on what our progress is. Um, because the regulatory considerations when you're doing a project like this are, are significant, especially as you go into the in-water portions of the project and need to deal with waterfront permitting, um, what it means to affect navigable waters, and, um, and if there should there be any fill um, within this area, um, needing to make sure that that's only, that's only gonna be done if absolutely necessary to help mitigate the impacts of climate change to this neighborhood. Um, so right here, um, we have one of the many high watermark signs across the city. Um, this one is right here at about four feet. Um, and this kind of shows you um, what water levels were like at this location during Sandy. Um, there are other high water mark um, um, markers as you go further down East River Esplanade um, by Pier 35. Um, I don't know if there's another one in Lower Manhattan. I think this is the only high water mark in Lower Manhattan. I just want two points of clarification. First of all, the pier goes up. Yeah. So just the second thing is the Captain Jonathan Bellwar, who's the current president of the South Street Seaport Museum was over there in the landlocked historic seaport and he first heard the water gushing through the basement of the historic buildings in the museum. So it's not only the water that you see, the wall of water from the surge above ground level, it's the water below ground that's a serious issue as well. So I just want to bring that to your attention. So Superstorm Sandy had a storm surge of 13 feet. 13 feet. So it wasn't a trickle. It arrives quickly. You want to be nowhere near it. I actually know a couple um, people who almost drowned, you know, near Glenroe Quarter, a Port Authority person. So you don't want to be there when there's a surge. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and it, it also just raises how much Lower Manhattan, too, is just evolving in and of itself as a neighborhood. We have, um, since the year 2000, a massive increase in residential population. Um, this is also a place of a lot of students. There's over 20 institutions of higher education. Um, and this is also just like a civic center where you have things like the Seaport Museum or you have Federal Plaza where George Washington was sworn in as, as president. Um, and you have City Hall. And this is why, you know, every demonstration in March passes through Lower Manhattan. Our ticker tapes come through here. Um, our, there's a lot of cultural events and activities. 
um, that are also vitally important and civic resources and institutions that are vitally important to lower Manhattan um, and, and the broader region. Um, and with that, I, we want to see if there's any Q&A um, from, from the group to see if we can answer. Yes, Stefan, do um, you have any other questions that came in? I saw we had a, a comment from our friends at the uh, South Street Seaport Museum, which we're obviously standing in. Yeah, the, uh, apparently the museum is back open for visitors. Uh, hey. And uh, we're really excited about that since we're looking at Waver Tree there. We did have a, a, a couple of slides that we didn't quite uh, get to. We we're looking at some of the images, wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about some of the tidal inundation. Uh, we uh, were so focused on looking at you folks that we uh, we didn't get to, to go to the slides about you know, how much the water levels are gonna rise in 2050, oh, okay. 2080, and 2100. Sure, Justin, we'll sure absolutely. Um, so what we're gonna see here in 2050, we anticipate 2.5 feet of sea level rise. And then by 2100, we anticipate six feet of sea level rise. What that means for this area is that the water you can see right here today, which is very close already, is actually anticipated to overtop and come up into lower Manhattan and up to over a block inland, flooding up to two times every single day by the 2080s. But, more, but less frequently than that, even sooner. And that will impact streets, buildings, our transit system, our ferries, and essentially lower Manhattan's ability to function. And that's why we need to do this plan right now. And we hope that you go to our website, edc.myc slash LMCR. You can go to the mayor's office, the resiliency website as well, and learn more about this planning effort as it evolves get involved, join our meetings, which we'll now be doing digitally um, and on Zoom and through a new website. So we look forward to engaging with you and to keeping the conversation going. Thank you for joining us. Great, I, I just wanna give a big thank you so much um, to, uh, to Elijah and Jocelyn and to Catherine for, for speaking that today. And thank you so much to our whole team, um, especially to, uh, to Stefan and Cindy in the studio and to our our great camera person, uh, Gina. Um, but yeah, so, but yeah, so, so, thank, so, you so thank you all so much, much. Um, to everybody. If you have any questions, um, you can always come back to our website um, where we'll have all of these resources listed. And if you joined us late, you can also watch the recording of this and also at the New York City Economic Development Corporation website. So we'll share all those resources uh, for you. Um, and continue to join us for our programs about climate week. So tomorrow we're going to be visiting a wood shop that is going to talk about sustainably sourced wood for manufacturing. And then on Thursday, we're going to look at how climate change is impacting uh, New York City parks. Um, and we're going to visit uh, with Prospect Park and the natural areas. So I just want to thank you guys so much. This is such an amazing experience and so much, so much insight. And I'm, I'm sure um, it's given us so much to think about. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you. We'll see you Thanks for having us. Today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Turnstile. <laughs>